All right. Okay, people. So um, I'm Angel. This is the Academy Presents Real Estate Investing Rocks. Today we have Tim Kelly on and he's going to be talking to us about mobile home communities, mobile home parks. He's going to be talking to us a little bit about just investor mindset and what it takes to be successful in this. Um, he is an active duty member of the United States Navy. He's a chief petty officer. He's been um, in the military for 14 years. Um, that's a really long time. That, that's what some people have spent in their careers so far, you know? That's right. Um, yeah. But, you know, just thank you so much for your service. Um, thank you for taking care of me and my family and making sure that we're safe. That, that's a really big deal. Um, so he is also into multifamily, um, which is kind of, where my passion is kind of heading as far as real estate investing. Um, but the other part of me is just, this is our educational platform for our business. And this is where my heart is. Um, I resigned from teaching in February. Uh, I was teaching middle school English. And so I will always have an educator heart. Um, I do still teach college economics, but it's just a little bit different than being in the public school setting. So, but um, this is educate, providing education is, where my passion lies. So that's, that's kind of where, um, all of this was born. And well, that's um, why we get along so well. <laughs> so you're into education too. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what we're doing with ADPI. I mean, I got a, a big, big heart for educating and helping other people. So, yeah. So I had someone ask me the other day. Um, I think he was under the impression that I was involved in ADPI. I was like, Oh, I'm not. I said, but this is my understanding of how it works. And so I told him, like, I think it's, you know, it's veterans, it's active duty personnel, and it's, y'all have, like, components in, like, a program where you can learn about different real estate investing niches. Is that on yeah, the right I, Yeah, I can give a, an overview um, here in a minute whenever, you know, I want to give, a, like, a really brief bio um, about, about me whenever you're done, and, okay. and then we'll talk about a little bit of what ADPI does for sure. All right. So um, if you want to go ahead and do that, you can. Cool. All right, guys. So uh, again, my name is Tim Kelly. Um, I am the the director of multifamily um, education w with ADPI, and just um, uh, we're going to talk about mobile home parks today. One of my one of my favorite asset classes. Uh, once I got into multifamily, and then mindset because mindset is everything. Um, and, and we're we're going to talk about it. Uh, you know, a lot of us hear people say, well, mindset is everything. What, what does that actually mean? And, and what could we do right now today to improve that? And I'm going to give you guys a lot of, a lot of gold nuggets on how to do that. So, um, so like, like, uh, Renee said, I'm, I'm an active duty chief petty officer. I'm stationed in Pensacola, Florida. And I really believe that the military training that is embedded into military personnel are literally tools to persevere and succeed in business and especially in investing. So um, lots of cool things there. And I think that's why we were all kind of bred to be, you know, very good business owners and investors. Uh, so, you know, on one of my deployments, I just had a stack of books about personal finance and wealth building, which I always was curious to learn more about. And I just kept coming across as real estate investing niche uh, is accessible to anybody that anybody could build wealth doing that. So I just kind of dove head first um, into that. And I learned more and more and more about real estate. And now um, I'm the senior managing partner um, at Kelly Housing Group and at ADPI Capital, which is the active duty passive income acquisitions team. And uh, so at this point, I have over a thousand units, uh, both uh, apartment communities, mobile home parks, and now we're looking at storage facilities. Um, the ADPI team and I, we wrote a best selling book called Military House Hacking. It's actually free on our website. Um, it tells a lot about the house hacking strategy and in the military and you have the VA loan to use. It's one of the best, you know, um, benefits that the military offers and you can get a 0% down loan. You can buy a fourplex with a 0% down. Um, love doing that. I've done, I've house hacked three different times and I, I love helping other people understand how to do that. And like I said, I'm the director of multifamily education and an executive partner. Um, at ADPI. So ADPI, we really, it's, you know, it's education is at our core and, and our, our mission is to help educate other military members, past and present and their families about how to achieve financial freedom in real estate investing. You know, so we, we have a best-selling book, Military House Hacking, that's free on our website. 
we have a podcast um, where we've interviewed people like Robert Kiyosaki and Grant Cardone and Jocko Willink and all these amazing people. Um, and then we also interview junior sailors and enlisted and commissioned personnel about how they've become successful after listening and going through our education and taking action. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And then, you know, we have a couple different books that are free. I wrote another one called The Blueprint to Financial Success, which is really the tools and things that we should have learned in school about money, right? Um, the, the financial foundation principles that you kind of need to have in place before you could just dive headfirst into, into real estate. So that, that book is free on our website. You know, we have a Facebook group, about 12,000 members and growing. It's just insanely growing, insanely fast. Amazing group, a lot of value. Um, no soliciting allowed. So it's just straight value. And we, we love, um, you know, engaging with everybody on, on, on our Facebook group. And we have, uh, you know, an academy and a mastermind for the residential one to four unit strategy. And we have an, ad, an academy and a mastermind for the commercial and multifamily. Because again, that's all I focused on. And that's I'm the director of the multifamily education, which includes that academy and the mastermind. Um, where we, I mean, we bring on guests that, that they, you know, all of our members have direct access to us. We give them an inside look at what ADPI Capital does. We're buying apartment complexes and mobile home parks. And we give them an inside look at how we raise capital, how we structure our deals, how we fund our deals, all that cool stuff. And um, we have, you know, we have a mortgage brokerage to fund deals better than most people who, most lenders out there, big banks, especially that think that they're awesome veteran VA loan experts and, and they're not. Um, they're really not serving the veterans well. So we, we, that's why we established our own mortgage brokerage. We established our own insurance brokerage so we could fund uh, policy, whole life insurance policies, which we believe are the best place to provide, uh, pr you know, uh, preserve capital. Um, so, you know, and we have a whole network and, and um, a coalition of certified agents that we can connect our members with too, that we vet, we interview them to make sure they're the best of the best and, and we connect them with our members. And so we have a lot, a lot happening, a lot going on, a lot coming in the future. Um, so that's just a little bit about uh, myself and, and ADPI. And I hope, I, I'm pretty sure we all have a why, right? My, my why is all kinds of stuff, but this, this is my beautiful, lovely wife, Allison. And we love being active in the community. We love traveling. We love giving back to the military. Um, she, she's uh, supervising one of the largest USO, which is, you know, you see a lot of USO centers in, in the airports and stuff like that. But the USO is really a place, a home away from home for military members, whether you're in Afghanistan or Iraq, overseas in Africa, or you're here at home. Um, and, and she, you know, manages all the volunteers, all the different programs. Um, huge fan of music and live music. I'm actually been drumming in my band. Um, we're gig we got a gig tonight, the first gig since COVID kind of struck <laughs> everybody. So I get to play the first show. So I, that, these, this is pretty much my why, why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I wake up at four in the morning to get hot and and kind of, you know, push the needle forward in multiple ways before my nine to five active duty job um, and, and why I'm, I'm trying to serve as many people as possible through ADPI. These kind of a couple of reasons why we love traveling the world. We love scuba diving and things like that. So, um, you know, I got here to Pensacola about three and a half years ago, bought a fourplex, um, you know, using a 203K FHA loan because I had to take advantage of that house hacking strategy. And then six months later, I bought a 42 unit apartment complex with these five fine gentlemen. And I just since that point, it's just been all large apartment communities and mobile home communities because um, I just honed my focus on multifamily and uh, never looked back. And it's just, you know, the, the minute I learned about multifamily, the minute I realized it's just made more sense for my goals. So um, before I just go ahead and dive in into mobile home parks and uh, then we'll transition in, into mindset, this is going to be somewhat of a 10,000 foot view level of, of mobile home parks, a lot of terminology, um, help you understand pretty much why we love mobile home parks, maybe some advantages and disadvantages and some, maybe some stigmas out there. Um, do you guys have any questions at all for me before, before we go ahead and get started here? Um, well, um, Kay Cheyenne had asked me, she said, you know, is single family better than multi? Um, I think you probably heard some of the conversation I was having. Um, my personal view is that multi is much easier to scale and you can mitigate the risk of vacancies. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the classic answer is it depends, right? It depends on your goals, on your skills and abilities, on your, on your, um, your team members, on what you want real estate to do for your life. Um, there are people who are vastly successful who never touched 
multifamily who they, you know, they were in single families, um, their, their whole career. But I do know a lot of those people are hurt the hardest during crashes, during recessions, during COVID type, type situations, um, because it's one door. And a lot of times it's, you know, it's obviously more to rent a home than it is to rent a small apartment or a trailer park, right. Or a unit in a, in a mobile home park. So, um, you know, it, it really, really, really depends. And there's not, there's not an answer because it depends on what makes sense for you. Multifamily immediately made sense for me because I'd rather close one deal with a hundred doors than close a hundred, a hundred different separate deals with one door each, but there's pros and cons. I mean, there are absolutely advantages of single family home than there is compared to multifamily. Um, so it really just depends on you. There's not one that's just ultimately better. And if anybody says that there is, then just don't listen to them because they're either selling something or they're not experienced. Um, I personally probably won't ever buy a single family home ever. Um, even to live in, like I'm always going to try to scoop up a property to live in where it's, there's at least two, three or four units because it just mitigates against risk. You have multiple units producing cash flow. You could have half the property, you know, vacant and you could still probably pay your bills and maybe get some cash flow if you buy it right and it's financed right, right? And it's managed right. So um, does that answer your question? I know she can't really respond to us, but. Well, I have the uh, chat window up, so I'm looking. She yeah. said yes. Cool. So and then that was kind of, that was kind of yeah. like what I said too. And it, I mean, it's, it's what your comfort level's at. Yeah. You know, are you comfortable in as a, we aren't GPs. We're passive in for syndication deals. Yeah. So, you know, are you comfortable just putting money out there and letting somebody else invest with it? Yeah. That's <laughs> um, a great way. I mean, a lot of GPs aspire to be a, an accredited passive investor like you guys, where they don't have to find the deal, negotiate the deal, do all, any of the work. They just take their cash that they've saved up over time and they have to learn how to vet the sponsors. They have to understand how to un, un, kind of do their own deal underwriting and understand deals, what deals look like. Um, but that's it. That's true passivity and mailbox money. You sit back, you just invest your capital, you get a quarterly dividend, double digit returns, plus a K1, plus tax benefits, plus equity growth. I mean, you get, you capture a lot of benefits of, of, of real estate. Um, uh, you don't get all five profit centers when you're a passive investor, you get more, you get more so of those profit centers and all the benefits of real estate when you're a general partner, but you're doing a lot more work. Um, so it really depends on what makes more sense to you. Um, but if you guys know the cash flow quadrant, I mean, when you're in a limited partner, you're on the right side of the quadrant. You're not exchanging your time for dollars. Uh, you are, it's true passive income and, and you're, you're an investor. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Um, and that's, that's how we structure some of our deals are syndications. Some of them are JVs depending on what's going on, but we've partnered with a family office at this point and they're funding all of our deals for us, which is pretty sweet. Oh, so. that's nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so any, any other questions before I kind of dive in here? All right. So, um, she says, how do you find these mobile parks and are these predominant in certain, in, so are they more predominant in certain States than others? Yeah. So, um, I'm going to talk about how do you find mobile home park deals? Cause then that actually applies to, um, both apartment complexes and then, and mobile home parks. Obviously there's some different, um, specifics to how you find mobile home park deals compared to apartment communities, but I'm going to get into that too. And, and absolutely, um, you know, there's just like analyzing a market for an apartment community or even a single family home, whether it's a portfolio or whatever, just a, a sound investment, you need to understand the market before you even start looking at the numbers and the financials of the deal. Um, because it's something you cannot move. It's more an, the, you know, an exterior impact than, than cause you could, you can control a lot more of that investment. You can evict people, you could force appreciation by adding value. Um, you could do a lot to control the income and expenses on the property, but you can't do anything to control the market. Right. So, um, understanding the market, um, demographics, making sure that there's diverse, um, employers, multiple strong employers that are growing, making sure that the population is slowly increasing over the last five to 10 years, you know, making sure unemployment is not below the national average. It's always helpful when the median home price is above a hundred thousand eat at least, and maybe more up closer to one twenty. 
because if the homes in that market are less than a hundred thousand, a lot of your potential tenants for affordable and workforce housing will be able to buy their own home instead of being one of your residents and your renters. So the median home price, usually we like to be over, you know, 120,000 um, on average. And uh, you know, the, the population not only should be going up, but it should be at least, you know, over 25,000 in, in that market or at least 50 miles away um, from a market that has at least 25,000 um, population. Um, but I'll tell you what, there's a, there's a huge demand. And so I'm just going to dive right in and, and we'll kind of talk about a little bit of that. And please, um, Angel, you know, if I'm going through something and, and just, just stop me if, if there's questions with what I'm talking about, otherwise I'm just going to keep powering through. Good to go. All right. We are good to go. Mobile home parks. Also, if you ever hear anybody talk about mobile home communities or manufactured home communities, trailer parks, all the same thing. But, you know, trailer parks is probably my favorite because it's got the stigma and, and that's what scares a lot of people. That's why a lot of people don't dive into them. So these are just some reasons why we love them. You know, it's a major solution to the affordable housing crisis. We all know there's an affordable housing crisis happening nationwide, right? So many people who need affordable housing do not have it provided to them. So if you could provide clean funds functional, safe, and affordable housing, it's going to be a sound investment if you're in the right market, right? And if it's marketed properly, if it's financed right and managed right, for every like, I mean, 10 people who need affordable housing right now, I think less than three, like 2.5 people have it provided to them. So if you can create affordable housing and market it right, um, that's why we love, that's why we love it. Um, and, and there's no more affordable type of housing than, than mobile home communities. I mean, the average apartment unit is over $1,000 a month, right? The average mobile home pad rent is not even 300 a month. So think, think about that. Like it's the most affordable housing. Um, so there's a lot less investor co competition. Cause like I said, you know, there's a stigma out there, you know, trailer park boys and eight mile and all these, you know, assumptions that nothing but crime happens in trailer parks and domestic violence and drugs and all this stuff. That is not true. There is just as many, uh, you know, apartment communities that are ridden with riffraff and crime than there are trailer parks or mobile home communities. It's just a stigma out there that scares a lot of investors. Like not even, they just turn their noses at it. So they even consider it, which is great. The more you know about it, you can just let all those people scatter off and Hey, I'll, I'll take this down because we know there's a lot more upside in mobile home parks than there are in apartment complexes. And so there's a far lower expense ratio and this is one of the reasons. So, you know, the idea is, is for most investors to get in and you have a split between park owned homes and tenant owned homes. Usually if you can, the goal is to have 100% tenant owned homes where you own the ground. They not only own their own home, they do all the maintenance, they're in charge of taxes, insurance, repairs, and they still have to pay you lot rent. And that lot rent, is only going up, which is another one of the advantages here. Your lot rent, like I said, is like less than 300. Uh, depending on the market, some lot rents, like obviously West Coast, five, 600 a month. But a lot of the parks we're looking at, we're buying are like 200 or less than 200, where, in the, where the market has room to grow up to like 300, 350. I mean, there's a lot of upside because moms and pops have been so afraid to increase lot rents over the last couple decades for fear of vacancy that there's just, you, you go in there. I mean, there's, even if you bump it up a hundred dollars a month, it's still, there's still no more affordable place to live. Right. Obviously you don't want to just do that. You want to be an empathetic capital capitalist, which is what we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, you know, you're going to get people pissed off if you increase rent, if you go in there, buy it and increase rents immediately that much, maybe 20, 30 a month uh, or 20, 30 a year. Um, but anyway, that's another huge benefit. And, and we really believe it's the, it's the housing with the highest returns because of kind of some of those advantages. And there's a lot more advantages that I, that I don't have really time to dive into, uh, but there are some disadvantages and it's not all rainbows, not pretty, obviously uh, there, there's a lot of things that, that really, even people who learn about mobile home parks are like, no, nah, it's not for me, uh, which, which is fine. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. So just some kind of basic terminology. If you know multifamily, you know A, B, C, and D class. Well, mobile home parks are often classified by stars. So one star to five stars, where one star is like the hood, you know, the war zones. You don't want to go there unless you're carrying heat right at night or even during the day. But um, the five stars are like your 
55 plus with bingo and shuffleboard and they have transportation and all gated community and those are what we really really like and that's kind of what we're shifting our business model towards because think about how many baby boomers right now are retiring and they're healthy and they just want to go socialize in a community that's safe and has all these amenities and they don't need anything more than just a single wide mobile home, you know? So, um, park owned home POH, like I said, when sometimes we buy parks where they're mostly park owned or maybe half park owned or some park owned where you have to take care of the maintenance and the repairs. And, but at the same time, it's more rent. It's just like you're renting out the lot plus you're renting out the unit. So you have more opportunity for gross income. However, that income is not capitalizable. The lot rent is, is capitalizable. So that's another kind of thing to take into consideration. So POH park owned home, TOH, tenant owned home. And then the mobile home, that term was coined in 1976. Um, when realistically it was supposed to be called the manufactured home. And then people just started calling it a mobile home because it has a hitch because you could, you know, hitch it to a trailer. And the most affluent people actually, when these were implemented in the fifties and sixties and seventies, like the, some of the most successful and affluent people actually were the only ones to have mobile homes because they were the only ones to be able to afford it in addition to their home. And so kind of over time, it kind of transitioned a little bit, but mobile homes, which is another huge advantage, they're not very mobile, right? Once you kind of put a mobile home into a park and you take the time to level it, brick it, you put the skirting around, which is kind of the white siding on the bottom that's called skirting you hook up all the utilities you skirt it in order to get that in order to unskirt it unhook all the utilities move it put it back down level it it, co it can cost between eight to ten grand sometimes and most mobile home park residents don't have that kind of cash right so that's why we love mobile home parks are not very mobile sometimes we do call them wheel estate <laughs> but <laughs> what ten, the tendency here is that when a mobile home park is sitting in a park, it usually doesn't move for a long time, um, which is another advantage over apartment complexes. A lot of times after their 12 leases up, 12 month leases up, they usually have a tendency to find a, find a reason to leave. So single wide, double wide, even a triple wide. These are just some more terms. As you can see, single wide is just the normal trailers that you think. Double wide is exactly twice the size. It's just kind of two together. There's not a wall in between, but it's two together. Um, those are some dimensions for you. And then the triple wide, there are people who have that kind of go big or go home mentality that live in trailer parks. Uh, it's literally three trailers wide. And those are, I mean, it's plenty of space. Um, absolutely. For even a big family of four or five. So um, uh, just a little bit of terminology. The hitch is kind of like on a, on a regular RV or trailer where you hook up their truck and, and you could, um, you could, you could tow it from place to place. And that's yeah. where it's called wheel estate or mobile homes. Right. So um, I have a question. Um, yeah. so if you've got, you've got your mobile home community and you're renting out the pads, so single versus double versus triple, do you have different size pads for those capabilities? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, we have a question. How many, I'm guessing bedrooms, it might be bathrooms, but I'm betting bedrooms fit in each. Yeah. So even a single wide could have three bedrooms and two bathrooms. That's usually the most. Um, some of them will be two. Some of them will be three. Usually most of them are, are going to be three. Um, a lot of them are two. Um, but like the double wides could have four or five. Triple wides could have, you know, five big four or five big bedrooms uh, it's i actually i've actually never seen or walked in a triple wide we don't have any triple wides in any of our parks we have double wides um, but some single wides even have three bedrooms two baths you can't really fit any more than and three in a single wide but a lot of them are twos um, so then when you a lot of the parks that we look at have some RVs, some of them have tiny homes uh, or modular homes, you know, some have stick built homes, right? Um, like the regular brick and mortar homes that a lot of us live in. Um, so this is just a couple more terms and, you know, we, we don't have any full blown RV parks. Um, we do have some parks that have RVs in them. Um, but, but I said a, a lot of the parks that were built and now they're up for sale or they're being they're undergoing transactions. They have RVs and, and tiny homes and, you know, the modular homes are just like kind of sort of like the manufactured homes, but they're built in modules. 
um, on site. Um, they're they're kind of towed and and transported to the site wherever they're going to be built, and they're kind of just built in big big chunks, big modules. So are those moved on like skids or? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, it really depends um, on the transport company and and the distributor and the manufacturer. Um, you know, there, there's probably a few different ways that they, those can be done. Um, but, but like I said, they're, they're, they're a lot more permanent than like a typical mobile home. Um, but they take a lot less time cause they're kind of partially built. The modules are built in the factory and in like, you know, four to six different pieces, they're just brought over to the site and then they're kind of just mounted together on site and you, you know, you can build a home really quickly in modules rather than from ground up. Um, on site. So, cool. um, land lease communities are exactly kind of, uh, a lot of those are what we spoke about, like the 55 plus communities, uh, you know, they have the, the amenities and maybe a, a clubhouse or a swimming pool. Um, and, and they have maybe social areas for people to kind of get together. Um, and, uh, the, the, it's just a great business model right now, I'm telling you. Wow. And so a lot of times, you know, since, the kind of the goal for a lot of, of mobile home park owners to have 100% tenant owned homes. But when you have maybe half of those are park owned homes, a lot of those tenants and or residents are willing to become homeowners. So we actually lease them back through a rent to own or a lease purchase option contract um, to where we are kind of like the note holder and, and we it's maybe we own the home. We can create a note and create a mortgage for them and they will just pay a mortgage. And as soon as their mortgage is paid off, they own the home and they'll only pay lot rent. And you know, the tenancy for all, um, park owned, you know, or tenant owned homes, it's, you know, they have a better sense of community and a sense of home ownership. So they usually they'll take more care of their, not only the home, but they'll help take care more of the community. Uh, they'll help kind of enforce and police people. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to having 100% park owned or tenant owned homes. So you could actually create this contract and, you know, while you're creating this contract, you could increase the lot rents because then eventually they'll only be paying lot rent. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And the lot rent and ground lease, same thing. You know, if they own their own home, then they're just paying lot rent, also known as ground lease. Um, MHAs is the mobile home association, just like there's RIAs in a, in a lot of different markets, real estate investment association. There's MHAs in, in each state and, and there's a, a lot of opportunity there to not only learn and grow, but it's just a network. I mean, there's so many resources and, and people who are in that, that, if you need any questions answered, especially if you're trying to learn the business, um, you know, being part of that MHA is pretty big. Cool. And then, uh, you know, stick built homes, just like a lot of them, a lot of us know with the, with sticks, two by fours, and, and then, you know, maybe brick around them or whatever, just those are stick built homes. And a lot of times the parks will have a single family home, maybe where when it was constructed, the owner lived there and then managed the whole entire park, right? Sometimes there's a duplex, sometimes there's a fourplex, sometimes you'll have like a small apartment complex on the site. So it really depends, but a lot of times there are, there are, are those homes. And um, most likely that's a stick built home situated in a mobile home park won't get the same amount of rent as a, the same exact st stick built home, you know, half a mile down the road in like a nice neighborhood. If it's the same exact thing, usually if it's right in a mobile home community, it's not going to get the same amount of rent as if it was outside, like in a, in a nicer neighborhood. So, so I have a question. When you said yeah. that you created the notes for like the lease to own. Yeah. Now it's my understanding that mobile homes have a title versus a deed. So how does that work? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. So there is a title just like a vehicle, you know, these these mobile homes are a depreciating asset, just like a car, right? Um, which is another reason why we don't like holding on to them. It's an asset that a depreciates. So um, the title holder is the one who ever holds the lien, um, just just like on a car. I mean, if they own the mobile home, we, we hold on to the title until it's fully owned outright. Um, um, from them, but they're required to get insurance and take care of all the taxes and maintenance and all that stuff. Um, just like you are for your home. If you live in, in your home or if you own your car, you're in, 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 you, you are responsible for paying taxes and paying insurance and paying off for all the maintenance. It's, it's the same thing. So, um, yeah, just like you said, there's, there's a title, um, just like a vehicle and, um, 
uh, depending on the newer ones, there are some newer ones with like different HUD um, restrictions and, and wind zones and stuff that are in the wow. different areas of the, of the U S uh, but yeah, just like, just like you said, there's, there's a title um, just like, just because it is considered a vehicle, it's a depreciating asset. Cool. Yeah. So let's talk about the, the ways to find deals. And this is a little bit different, um, but very similar to, a, to apartment complexes. So, um, you know, whether you're interested in mobile home parks or not, this is a good way just to find deals in general. So um, kind of just like you've heard of maybe LoopNet or, or Zillow, another public listing site for mobile home parks is the mobilehomeparkstore.com. And so you know, a lot of people think, you know, LoopNet has this bad reputation and this is where deals go to die, right? Um, but a lot of times, you know, because it has this stigma and this reputation, a lot of investors overlook deals on LoopNet and they're not even paying attention to it, right? So um, not only is it great for practicing, maybe uh, just analyzing deals and getting your kind of getting your, your reps in and just you have to analyze a lot of deals in order to get good at analyzing deals. Right. So a lot of times loop net listings have the financials right there, ready for you to just do a full underwriting. Um, and, but at the same time, and this is actually the, the next thing is loop net is a great place. Mobile home park store is a great place. Correct. is a great place to find brokers, which is the second place, you know, um, connecting with brokers, you know, one of my mentors told me, you know, uh, one broker could make you wealthy, right? One broker could uh, assist your financial freedom journey and make, make you very, very wealthy. Nice. Um, there's a lot of brokers out there who um, are straight salesmen. Um, that, that's kind of what they do. They, they only get paid if it closes. So a lot of them will just kind of tell you whatever you need to tell you whatever they need to tell you in order to just get the deal closed. Right. Yeah. Uh, but some brokers are great and, and, and uh, you know, building relationships with the right brokers is, is what we do to find some of our deals. And then some of them are just other creative ways that we find our deals. But you know, the keys to, to, to broker relationships is trying to get them to show you their pocket listings or their off market listings, right? Where it's not just, Hey, I'm listing it on loop net or I'm listing it on Crexy or I'm listing it on my brokerage site where everybody sees it because those are, especially right now, there's not, those are not considered deals. People who buy those deals either negotiate those deals way down or they overpay. Right? So the goal is to get the pocket listings or the, the, the off market listings in order to do that, you just need to prove to the broker that it's worth their time to spend with you, right? Because again, they don't get paid unless they close, uh, unless you close the deal. So you have to prove to them, A, you have the capacity to close the deal by showing them you know what you're talking about, you know exactly what you're looking for, you know your exact criteria, you have the cash or you have access to capital to close the deal. And then you know what strategy is you're going to imp implement. You know what exit strategy you're going to use and proving to that to them. And then following up is key. And that is how you kind of get on the, on that pocket listing side and, and uh, you know, could, could have the broker show you those off market deals. Um, so Angel, do you have anything you want to add or any questions from the group? Um, I am not seeing any, um, I'll just kind of add to the pocket listing idea too. Um, yeah. it's kind of like if you're shopping at a jewelry store or like a boutique clothing store and the owner, like you're there enough that the owner gets to know you and know who you are and what your tastes are, they're going to be more likely to hold stuff back for you. Um, so it's, if, if people have a hard time understanding like what a pocket, pocket listing is, it's kind of like your broker is holding stuff back because they know what you like. And they know what your capabilities are. And so they're holding that back for you. And if, if you know, you let them know what your exact criteria is and they don't have anything, but three weeks later you follow up with them and then boom, all of a sudden they have a deal that meets your criteria. Who are they going to think of? You know, you're the one that gave them your exact explicitly clear criteria and you followed up you know, just because they don't have a deal right now for you doesn't mean that they, in, in two weeks, they, they won't, you know? Um, so it's really important to, to, to do that. And, um, you know, the, the other thing is really, really, really important that I can't stress enough. Um, the people who you like brokers, property managers, any kind of agent or investor or partners, 
you know, the key is to partner with these people and the key is to get to know them and be interested in what they want out of the transaction. It's not about you. It's about how could you partner together to get to the same finish line, right? And if a broker sees that you're like interested in what their goals are and what they want and how they got into real estate and, you know, some of the ways they struggled and overcame them and their successes and uh, do they invest and what do they like to do for fun? Um, you're going to not only build a bond, but they're going to think about you when they have a deal that meets your criteria because you took the time to be interested in them and get to know them a little bit. This is a relationship business. Building relationships with everybody that you come into contact with in this industry is just going to put you at a huge advantage. Um, so, you know, don't forget, don't forget about that relational aspect. It's super important. Yeah. Well, and one of just one of my little tips that I kind of throw out there and I, I probably shouldn't ever tell anybody about it, but in my own personal database, I have a column that is like weird fact or like something that kind of sets that person apart in my memory and I'll put that down. So, you know, if it's something like left-handed person or um, this person grew up in such and such town, or we have this mutual friend and I put something over there in that column that makes that person stand out in my mind. So there's always that, that relatability factor, because that's, um, I think that's really huge when you're trying to build relationships quickly. It's becoming very relatable, very quickly. And gosh, just be genuine, be yourself, be authentic, because humans weed that out. And you can just tell, and it's really off-putting when someone is clearly trying to be something they're not. <laughs> so. so That's so amazing, and that's such a great idea. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have a system down like that, but a lot of times when I save, you know, a contact in my phone, I'll, I'll say, Hey, he's an investor and he's active duty or this and that. And then I usually try to have something that, like you said, that helps them stick out that I could, you know, when I go touch base with them, I could bring that up and help break the ice and help them understand that I actually remembered that and that it, it means something to them. Because like I said, man, people could see right through, you know, um, disgenuine behavior and so uh, another thing that I do every every single you know holiday season I will hand write cards to everybody that I did business nice. with and send them out you know and if I don't have their address you know around Thanksgiving or a week later hey man can I get your personal your home address you know um, and I and I have a list every single person I, I literally hand write those cards and just that one little gesture goes a real long way um, yeah, I did, um, I did little Starbucks cards to all of my speakers from my last summit. Um, nice. and they did know, cause I, I was talking to people before Christmas and so I sent them out for Christmas and then the summit was in March. So that was my thing. I, cause I love Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. Who does it? <laughs> oh, well, I have people that don't. And I'm just like, what is wrong with you? Well, they're probably lying <laughs> <laughs> or they just don't like spending five bucks for a cup of coffee. I mean, uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So this is again, this is another, this is another way to find mobile home park deals that where you can find great deals, you know, um, direct mail from a list. There's all different ways you can get addresses and from public, uh, listing sites. And, and even if you pay for like a pay, like place like called list source where you could buy lists of, of property owners and you just have a, a yellow letter. And, and the key thing about this, a lot of owners, especially from multiple multifamily, both, both apartments and mobile home parks are probably getting a lot of letters, right? So again, you have to figure out what do you, what can you do that to help you be remembered, right? What could you do that others are not willing to do? And that's the handwriting letters, just being genuine, maybe adding a picture of yourself. And, you know, for us, it helps that we're active duty. You know, we, we have a picture of us in uniform saying, Hey, we're a military team. Uh, we're, we're showing other investor or military personnel how to achieve financial freedom in real estate. We want to buy up as much of America as possible, especially if they're military or they're in a military family, that's an immediate bond. Um, so, and then the, the key thing is, you know, from, from that, the key thing is following up with a call, either cold calling just direct from that list or sending them a letter. Then a week or two later, following it up with a phone call. That is how, again, how you're remembered. You just track that marketing system where you send them a letter. Then a week or two later, you cold call them say, Hey, I just sent you a letter. I, you know, I'd love to speak to the owner. And if you're, if, and when you're willing to sell, I'd love for you to think about us. Um, we're looking to buy properties just like yours within the next year, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. Either, either way, whatever, whatever your script is, there's tons of scripts out there, but 
you almost don't want it too scripted. You know, you want it to be just genuine. It's about the relationships, the mom and pops that own the mobile home parks and the apartment communities that you're, you're going to want to buy are people. And they put a lot of emotion and time into these assets. And a lot of times it's their only retirement plan for them and their kids and their legacy and just build, taking the time to build that rapport and getting to know them and then remembering something about them and calling them a month later, say, Hey, I'm the one, you know, I learned that you love NASCAR or I learned that you do this or that you also live in the same city that whatever. And just building that rapport, following up. I mean, cold calling is a great way just to be yourself on the phone and just ask questions about them, about how they got into real estate, about, um, you know, the story behind their deal and, and why are they selling? And just obviously you'll, you'll uncover a lot of, just asking really good questions, you'll uncover a lot of the story and maybe what motivates them and getting to know them is not only going to be build rapport, but it's also going to reveal that kind of their pain points and being help being, you know, letting them know that you're trying to come to the same finish line that you, you could help them with their pain points. Maybe they just want to, they want to offer creative finding, but they need or creative financing or seller financing, but they need like X amount of dollars in order to pay something off or they need X amount of dollars per month, getting to know them and what their pain points are by cold calling them and, and showing them that you actually care uh, that you're not trying to just ju you know, to, to, to bring them down to the lowest uh, uh, amount of money. You're trying to get to the same finish line. You're trying to make a good deal. Uh, that's obviously going to help because not a lot of investors do that. Yeah. Well, it's that win-win situation. You want everybody to feel like they're coming out ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like we're, we're working through uh, a mass release option right now with, with like a hundred unit uh, apartment community. And we were kind of going back and forth and they're in distress. They're, they're, it's, you know, it's their expense ratio is like 120%. It's ridiculous. Yikes. And they're, it's a huge liability for them. And we're working through a, a, a deal with them where it's like partially owner financing, but partially a master leaps option where they're still going to own it, but we're going to take it over. And then in about two years, we'll fully own it and pay them and buy them out. Um, because they're in a really bad situation. So especially with COVID where they didn't really know what to do and they didn't um, put the time in to, to figure that out and take care of the residents. So, but anyways, like driving for dollars, you know, on its own, or, you know, you send them a letter, you do cold calling, and then you drive for dollars and actually go to that property. Either you have someone go to the property or you personally go to the property and, you know, you knock on the maintenance or the, the manager's door or you find the owner and you, ex you just you know, introduce yourself. Hey, you know, I sent you a letter and I gave you a call. I'm just following up. I really, we're really excited about this deal. We'd love to make a deal with you, blah, blah, blah. Just showing up and driving for dollars, not only to, 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 again, to find deals that are just off market that are not listed, you know, everything is for sale guys. You have to understand everything is for sale. Um, a lot of things, a lot of assets that you know, have owners that want to sell, just don't know how to contact a broker and help them sell it. Or they're not willing to contact a broker because the broker is going to charge them an arm and a leg and, and, you know, try to get too much of a commission. They don't want to pay a commission. So they just don't list it. But if you send them a letter, you give them a call and you drive to them and say, Hey, I'm genuine. I want to make a deal. They're going to be like, okay, well, we'll kind of off, you know, let's, let's, let's talk. Let's, you know, let's get into a negotiation. Um, are there any questions? I see some, I see some questions coming through. I just don't have the, the chat box up. Um, it was more me asking for the proper pronunciation of a name. Names are very important. Um, and so I hate to get them wrong. Totally. <laughs> Absolutely. Mine should be pretty easy. <laughs> I don't know. I kept typing it as time and everything that I was typing up to get this. It happens. <laughs> it happens. So, you know, there, there is a little bit of a difference and a delta between mobile home park residents and apartment complex residents, especially the A and B class, you know, and this is, this is what we've learned over time and learning and understanding mobile home park tenants. And, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, you know, you have direct control of their lives. They have the same needs that we do. They want a nice, clean, safe place to live. That's affordable to raise their family and you guys have a direct impact on the lives of these residents. Um, so, you know, if, if you create a culture, like you're showing them that you actually care, that you want them to have a nice quality of life, 
you know, that is contagious. That is going to spread. The culture is going to improve. They're going to tell all their friends and family, hey, I live in this mobile home park where the owner actually gives a shit, you know, part of my French. But oh, no, that absolutely. is an amazing. That's an yeah. amazing thing you could do just to prove that you care. And so keeping those residents is really important and just doing what you say you're going to do. Let's say if it's a park owned home and you know, they have a leaky faucet or a broken toilet or a broken window, you know, addressing it timely, you know, let them know that you care that, look, I want to fix, I want to make sure you have a good quality of life. Um, you know, and, and you want to be respected, but you don't want to be a bully, right? You want to be firm um, with with really evicting the bad people. And if they're not paying rent, but they're coming up with stories and stories, no pay, no stay is in full effect, right? You have to, you can't just give in to that. I mean, it's one thing if they've been paying for 10 years and then all of a sudden they lost their job and maybe they're, you could actively, you know, they're actively looking for a job and like, it's very situational based, but if it's a tenant that you don't really know, or they've just had a bad track record and they're kind of just coming up with stories. I mean, no pay, no stay, but you got to care about and, and be empathetic. And that's why I, you know, I love the term empathetic capitalist, you know, being an empathetic capitalist is really important. And so how do you get, how do you deal you know, with the riffraff and the riffraff, that term is kind of like what this really, what the stigma is, right? right? You know, like the drugs, the gangs, uh, the noisy late nights, all that crime and violence that everybody thinks that happens all the time in, in mobile home parks. And it's really, you know, making sure that you don't allow any riffraff in that, that's step one is to make sure your tenant screening process is in place that you're not just allowing the first person who gives you a wad of cash to move in. That's a huge red flag. Um, you know, if they don't, if they don't pass a tenant screening policy, if they don't have proven income, if they've ever been evicted, it's a no, no. Um, you know, if they, if the references aren't legit when you call them, if they have a terrible credit score, I mean, they got to pass a good tenant screening, but the ones who are already in there, how do you, how do you really get rid of them? You know, no pay, no stay. If they're not complying with your lease agreement, if they have dogs on chains or staying up late at night, you have to enforce that. And that's another really good you know, reason to have a relationship with people at city hall, especially the law enforcement and building relationships with people at city hall is super, super important. I have actually a slide that I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but I mean, these are, these are some things you could do. You just, you know, uh, of course you want to be an empathetic capitalist. You want to be very reasonable, very fair, but you have to be firm and you have to mean what you say. You have to, if you say like, look, you can't do this or you can't do that. And if someone's doing it, you have to be firm and, and handle it and address it. If you have to pull in law enforcement, do it. Um, so any questions at all so far? Um, so I have one. So um, my grandparents self-managed. It's the reason why I will never self-manage. <laughs> but yeah. can you get management agencies for mobile home communities? Yeah, that's a really, really, really good question. Um, you know, there are some firms out there that actually offer um, management like full-blown property management like you would see in a lot of a lot of uh, uh, apartment complexes and they'll even offer like you know due diligence assistance and construction management and reposition management for like big deep rehabs um, most ca I have not found a good one they're out there I have made relationships with them, but we've never used them because we've always questioned it because of, we do a lot of due diligence on these companies and no one is all like, yeah, they're awesome. We use them. They're great. So that's actually one of the things, one of the challenges is management, which we'll, I'll talk about a little bit more in depth in a second, uh, but that's such a great question. So some of the kind of the challenges that owners face, like I said, it's not all, all, all rainbows and amazing bright, you know, sunny days at, at mobile home parks, there are some disadvantages to owning them and uh, reasons why some people who learn about them still don't move forward with them. And one of them is their limited books. You know, a lot of these moms and pops, you know, keep uh, their, their, their P and L or their rent rolls literally on a piece of paper or in like a basic Excel spreadsheet, if you're lucky. Right. And they're very limited. So it's really hard to like underwrite deals that with accuracy, um, because of that. So that, that's why we have to be super conservative, but it's just like a normal thing, you know, with, with mobile home parks, it's just, you can't assume that they got really, really clean books. Yeah. My um, grandparents had written receipts, handwritten receipts. There you go. Um, and yeah. it was, it was literally sheets of paper. And like, if someone came to them, they could tell you how much the rent was for each unit. 
Yeah. But they couldn't tell you. I mean, they could be like, oh yeah, this person's been here for 10 years. This person's been here for 16 years. Oh, yeah. this person just moved in. But you, there, there wasn't a lot of consistency to it just because, I mean, my grandparents didn't even use a computer. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, tell, do you want to tell us about kind of the park and, and what their experience was in mobile home parks? Um, so the very first um, trailer that went out there was actually one that they had lived in while they were building their house. It was a single wide. It was a three bedroom. And I remember, I mean, you walked in the front door and there was the living room and the kitchen. Kind of, it's almost like, it was almost like a long galley. So, you know, you've yeah. got, you've got the living room, the kitchen, and then bedroom one to the right, walk down the hall, bedroom two to the right. And then at the very end was the master bedroom. So that, that was the first one. The next one was like a really small, and it was literally a travel trailer. And when my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago, um, I was going to take over some of that stuff. And the resident in that travel trailer had been there 16 years, like for real, 16 yeah, years. I'm telling you, that's how um, long people stay in these parks, man. Yeah, it was, it was a long time. And then the one across from that was a little, um, it was a two bedroom, but my grandparents had, because they owned them all. So my grandparents yeah. had had an additional bedroom built onto it. So it was like this hybrid apartment trailer thing <laughs> with a porch. Yeah. Um, and people really enjoy renting that one out. And then they had a double wide in the front that um, usually had families in it. Yeah. So, but at, since they owned them all, what they did was they put these huge carport type things over them That's to awesome. protect the roof. Yeah. And then um, they would put out clotheslines and things like that just to assist people. Yeah. Um, at one point they were going to do a small um, like washeteria on site, um, but they never really got around to that. So it was um, lots yeah. of ideas. They wound up putting storage units in the back of the park. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's awesome, man. <laughs> so just, There's a lot of different yeah. ways to add value to parks. And one of the biggest ones right now is storage units, um, you know, creating those carports, um, you know, and there's a lot of buildings that are existing on these in these mobile home parks that are just vacant and not occupied. You know, there's no use for them. You could turn them into storage units or you could turn them into some kind of community or maybe like a, a laundry facility or something like that. Um, well, and yeah, a lot of times the residents will rent the storage units from you. Yeah, absolutely. No, exactly. That's, I mean, yeah, you would put storage units in there for extra added value. They'll pay you another 50 bucks a month or a hundred bucks a month or whatever. Absolutely. Because obviously we know people like hoarding stuff and people have too much crap. And if they're <laughs> in a mobile home, park and chances are they don't have space for all the stuff that they want to hang on to so um so those are again a couple other things the mom and pop parks usually a, a lot of those mom and pops would accept the first person to give them a lot of cash so they don't have very vet, good vetted tenants and a lot of them are poorly vetted so you are inheriting a lot of times some some bad tenants um, one of the biggest disadvantages is that the, the zoning, um, you know, is either incorrect or it's, it, it doesn't comply with new codes for the city. Um, a lot of times if there's a transaction, then there has, everything has to be brought up to code. Um, that, that, that's a huge thing. And, and, uh, and so with that, I'm going to say, you know, a lot of people have questions on, Hey, well, what about developing new parks? And so the zoning is, is, is going to be a key contributing factor here why cities will both love them and hate them. And the reason why they don't like them is because if they have, you know, 10, 20 acres, think about how many apartment units they could put on there and how much tax revenue they can get from that versus if you have that same amount of land, you, you know, a mobile home park each individual trailer will have its own space. You can't stack them, you know, so you can't put as many people in that trailer park and there's a lot, lot, lot less tax revenue for the city. So it, unless it's already zoned as a mobile home park, um, it's nearly impossible to rezone something unless it's already zoned a mobile home park. But at the same time, if it is zoned a mobile home park, the cities love investors that go in there and create a nicer community and add value um, because it is a, again, you're solving the affordable housing crisis that is probably happening in their city, but they don't want them to be new mobile home parks developed unless it's already zoned for it. Um, so, you know, a lot of the old utilities and infrastructures, your waters and your sewer, whether they're city or private, um, a lot of those are going to be high capital expenditures uh, to repair 
and so that that's just another that's just another thing especially if it's like septic tanks or wells or lagoon systems that haven't been cared for uh, and that's just the importance of, of due diligence and you know obviously due diligence is broken up into your 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 market due diligence your property due diligence and your financial due diligence it's really important to hit all those three all right, so, so there, there is a question um so if you buy a commercial property you can't just turn that into a trailer um into a mobile home community it has to be zoned mobile home yeah i mean you gotta have the relationships with city hall city hall has to approve it i mean you gotta that's why again i'm gonna talk about that here in a second um building relationships with the people at city hall specifically your economic development your planning and zoning the city inspector the fire marshal um, these are all really good people that you're going to need at some point while you own it, most likely before closing. Um, so it's always best to be the first one to be proactive and just go introduce yourself while you're, while you're under contract. Um, what, after you submit your offer, just let them know who you are, that you actually have good intentions. Um, and then you, you have to get their approval to rezone, uh, their property. Right. So, um, a lot of times, unless they, you know, they're, they're, they, they, most of the time, unless that, you know, some of those uh, people who work in City Hall are like capitalists and they own mobile home parks and they really love and they support that idea, then it's going to be tough to rezone an existing commercial property, whether it's raw land, zone, something else. Um, but it's, I, I don't want to say never say never. It's always worth a shot. It's always worth a shot to just go talk to them and be like, hey, this is my idea. But yet, if you prove to them that you're real, you know, hey, I have this idea. And then like, you don't really give them any more feedback. You can't, you're not really selling to them that you actually know what you're doing or that you have the, the capital or that you have the knowledge or experience to do it. Then they're probably not going to be on your side. But if you go there and talk to them with your full blown business plan with maybe a credibility book, proving who you are, that you have experience, that you have capital, maybe you show them your proof of funds. Um, then it's going to be a lot more likely if they're even considering it, if, if that makes sense. Does that answer your oh, question? Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. Um, so uh, another couple more disadvantages, you know, a lot of the park owned home parks, some of the parks that we look at, the mo they're mostly park owned home and, and sometimes we can get a great deal on them. But a lot of times the maintenance, uh, you know, because mom and pops who own these, a lot of times they do their own work. So they don't report whenever they do maintenance on trailers. So it could look repairs and maintenance are, Hey, it's only like a thousand bucks for the year when realistically they worked on it every month, but they just didn't document all those hours and all that labor. But if you're, unless you're going to go do it yourself and you're okay with not paying yourself, then you have to be conservative and factor that in. And that's where sometimes you don't know, you know, you have to just be very conservative and kind of know what, what the, what the rule of thumbs are for, you know, based on the condition, based on the age, how much usually per year, you know, and that's usually two, two to three hundred dollars a month per unit. Um, if, if it's an older unit, like 80s, probably 90s or older. Um, so many, many parks are situated in like the southeast or the Midwest where there's tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff like that. So just having the right insurance, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy because some of these that are in these flood zones or in these hurricane or tornado zones haven't had any kind of disaster hit them in years and years and years. That doesn't mean it won't. That might mean that, hey, they're due for one, right? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy them because of just having that fear. Um, flood zones are a little different. A lot of times if it's in a flood zone, it's because it actually has flooded in the last five to ten years um, and it's caused damage. But that's the purpose for due diligence. That's the purpose for ins the right insurance. Um, and, you know, if something happens, having a contingency plan for what you're going to do with your residents um, who can't afford to move or can't afford to stay in the hotel. So again, that's, that's the right type of insurance coverage and, and make sure you, you, you're building a relationship with the right insurance broker for those types of situations. So like case in point, mobile home parks are not for everybody. There are more disadvantages, but there's a lot more advantages that, I mean, again, we don't have time to bring up. We love them. We buy them. There's always a way to, around to figure out every obstacle, but a lot of these disadvantages are what scare people away, which hey, make more opportunities for us to just figure it out. Maybe put a little more time and effort, maybe reach deeper into our networks and who could help us and who's done this already to go, just go figure it out. Right. And be that, have that success mind. So, um, 
these are some kind of keys to profitable and successful investing. And, and so some of these do apply to, to apartments and mobile home parks. You know, number one, you have to make sure you understand the market and you do your market due diligence. I talked about that um, kind of before and, and the key metrics are here at the bottom. Um, you know, make sure that there's actually, there's most likely going to be a demand for affordable housing, but only in those markets that show, you know, employment growth, strong, um, you know, population growth, di diverse employment. Like I said, the average home price, no, no less than hundred K. Um, and so a lot of the trade, these trailer parks are situated in secondary, some tertiary markets where it might not, there might not be a huge demand because population has gone down and there's just not jobs. So people are just not living there. Right. So um, make sure you do your, your ad, very adequate market due diligence first. Um, when, when I say municipal utilities, that means city water and city sewer versus your private utilities like the septic tanks and lagoons and the wastewater treatment plant and, and stuff like that. And it doesn't automatically mean that city water is better. Um, a lot of people think it is because there's a direct billing with the city. But either way, if it's city water, city sewer that it was developed, you know, 50 years ago, this is still going to be your responsibility to understand what the condition is. If it breaks, it's on you. If the lines rupture, it's on you. A lot of the times we're, we're looking at parks that have all these beautiful trees, but guess what happens <laughs> underground? Yeah. Those roots are going to snake around those lines, crack them, destroy them. And that's on you as the owner to make sure. So municipal utilities aren't always the best because if you take a look at those compared to a private utility that was cared for and it's in great condition, I would rather have a private utility, even if I know nothing about it, I'd figure out who the experts are in the area to, for due diligence. I would figure out how to use them and maintain them you know, if it was really well maintained versus the city water, city sewer who have old metal lines who are all corroded and cracks and stuff like that. But we boroscope all of our lines um, during um, all our due diligence to, to make sure we know exactly what we're getting into. Obviously PVC is the newest and the best. Um, PVC is always, always, always going to be the best just thick plastic uh, lines instead of old metal lines that corrode. Um, but uh, a really good national company that can help you with that is ALD American leak detection. They are kind of nationwide and they can help kind of boroscope those lines for you, whether you're looking at apartment communities or mobile home communities, they're everywhere. Um, and they're very affordable. They have great systems in place and they're quick and they got great customer service from our, um, from our experience. So uh, another thing when you're analyzing deals, you know, sometimes it's park owned homes. You have a lot of park, uh, unit or unit rent plus lot rent. But when you're factoring in for analysis, only, only add in the lot rent itself. Um, again, that's the, all that's capitalizable. And also most owners who own these park owned homes are going to eventually lease it back to the resident. So you're going to eventually lose that income. So it's always best to only factor lot rent into your numbers when you're analyzing deals. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, you know, um, moms and pops and regular owners, even if they're sophisticated, they will put a value on those homes. They will put a value on that gross park owned rent. Um, so you, I mean, just, just understand that you, in order to be the most conservative and to buy it right, it's only, you, you know, make sure you're only factoring lot rent into your numbers. So cap rates are higher than in mobile home parks than they are in apartment complexes straight up. Um, that's one of the reasons why we looked at mobile home parks uh, like about two and a half years ago when cap rates were really starting to squeeze, interest rates were kind of going up. So that spread, that arbitrage in between the, the interest rate and the cap rate, really that gives you your return. A really good rule of thumb is between like two and a half to 3% spread in between your interest rate on your debt and your cap rate is something really, 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 it's a really good rule of thumb. If you have about two and a half to 3% arbitrage spread in between those, that means you could probably pay investors a really good double digit return on their investment. Um, so when cap rates were going down and interest rates weren't going down with them, they were kind of going up, the arbitrage that spread was squeezing for apartment complexes. So apartments were harder and harder, harder to find deals. That's when we shifted. We're like, well, what else? What other asset class is good? And they're like, 
you know, we just started doing research and that's where the mobile home park kind of came into our life. And we're like, look, this is, this is, this is, there's an opportunity here. Let's, let's dive in. And so usually your cap rates are going to be higher on mobile home parks versus, um, versus apartment complex. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, there's reasons for that. I, I, I went over some of the disadvantages for that. You know, if you look at an apartment complex, an A class apartment is not going to be a high return, but think about how much less management intensive it is versus a D class, you know, apartment that you're going to have 15% cap rate, but Hey, you're going to need like security there 24 seven. You're going to be dealing with some, some uh, like obnoxious behavior. Right. So, um, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, you know, the, the higher cap rate, usually the more management intensive it is, but if you have a hundred percent, tenant owned homes in a good market and it's good roads and it's good utilities. And, and, and uh, I'm, I'm telling you, it's one of the best investments you could make. And kind of going back to an empathetic capitalist, right? Pushing rents fairly, but relentlessly. We talked about how a lot of times lot rents are way below where they need to be way below market, but that doesn't mean you can go in there and increase lot rent a hundred bucks a month right there on the spot. Um, consider, and this is going back to understanding your, your mobile home park resident, right? Um, imagine if you were living in the mobile home park and you're making like 30 grand a year, 40 grand a year household income. And all of a sudden your landlord went in there and just increased lot rent a hundred dollars a month. I mean, for us, that's like, you know, if for us living in nice apartments or nice homes, that's if our rent or mortgage went up like four or 500 bucks a month, that's like the same thing, right? Respectively. So um, usually 20, 25, maybe 30 bucks a month um, for the first year, right? If, and, and that's if you justify by cleaning it up, you know, improving the landscaping, improving the signage, getting rid of the riffraff, enforcing laws and, or enforcing rules. Um, even if it's way below lot rent, you, you know, be an empathetic capitalist and I'm telling you, it's going to come back uh, very, very, uh, very well for you. And so getting to know the right people at city hall, I mentioned this already. It's so important that you go introduce yourself to these people because especially in the mobile home park arena, there's a lot of crappy slum Lord mobile home park owners, right? Especially if like you take a city where most of the mobile home park owners are crappy slum Lords the city is going to see, Hey, this one's for sale. Hey, there's going to just be another crappy slumlord that's going to buy it. So they're automatically going to assume that that who is who you are and what your business model is. But if you go are proactive and you introduce yourself to city hall, this is who we are. We're good people. This is our plan. We are serious. We know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. And then you make a decision and, and you talk to economic development, the planning and zoning, the city inspector, you know, the fire marshal, even like a smaller tertiary secondary markets, you could go directly talk to the mayor. I mean, if you talk to the mayor and build rapport with the mayor, you're going to be at a big advantage when you need them. And, and uh, you just, again, this is going back to the whole partnership thing. You're partnering with the city to make sure this is a successful asset for you. Um, so this is just a really good thing to do. We implement that in all of our due diligence, pro due diligence processes. We make it, we build a relationship with people at city hall. What questions do you guys have? Because this, this part fires me up. I mean, I love my lawn parks, but the mindset game, how to win the mindset game, this part fires me up. So I hope you're, I hope you're awake. And if you got some questions, please ask them, but I'm all about right. to get excited here. Okay, so um, there is something here. It says, um, if you purchase something as a park owned, everything's park owned, how would you move from park owned to tenant owned? Yeah, that's a really good question. And there's so many strategies to do that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people who are looking to move into a park that want to be um, owners that are willing to be a, be a park owner or a, a homeowner. Um, and maybe they have some skills, right? Maybe if you have like a fixer upper, uh, one way to do it is if you don't really charge them for the home itself, but maybe it needs a little bit of love. They can come in as a handyman special and they'll work. You could literally just donate the, 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 the trailer to them, or maybe like for 500 bucks or like a thousand bucks, super cheap, um, depending on the condition and the market. And then not only will you offer them, um, a very affordable or free unit, you're going to have someone 
you're going to have them fix it up for you, but then you can bring your lot rent up to market, right? At the same time. Um, that's a great way to bring your lot rents up to market and make a homeowner very happy, right? And get a unit that's going to be fixed. You're taking a risk doing that unless you could like confirm that they have those skills. Maybe like it's a really good, you know, kind of to keep in mind, they have to prove that they're, that's what they do for work you know, that they work in construction or they're a handyman or they work, you know, Home Depot or something like that, where they are, they're around, they have those skills. Um, but another way, even if they don't have those skills, maybe it's a nice home, um, offering it for very, very, very affordable or something like, like a dollar a month or something for the first year, um, having them move in for free, but again, bringing that lot rent up to market, especially if lot rents below market. Um, and then, like I said, just rent to own. Um, you're offering this nice home uh, for a very affordable mortgage, whether it's 15 grand, 20 grand, depending on the, you know, uh, the condition where you are, you're, you're the middleman. Uh, sometimes, sometimes there's these other cool distributing companies that are manufacturer and they distribute and they will create a mortgage between the, the resident and them. And you're kind of the middleman because a lot of times you're supposed to be a licensed broker or dealer in order to sell the mobile home. So if you're not, that's where you have to just be very careful and make sure you understand the local laws um, where you, you can't just create a mortgage out of thin air. It has to be some kind of, um, it has to be some kind of promissory note. Um, and, and that's, it, that's legal and compliant. So make sure you understand that unless you have a third party doing that, doing that for you. So you're talking about like a, what is an R R M L O? Yes. Okay. Yep. I don't remember what the letters stand for, but I remember the letters. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, that, that is, um, it, that is just the, that is, that is from my understanding and I've never actually dealt with that. That just sounds really familiar that it's, that that's kind of like the license and the training and certification that you kind of need and have to go through in order to be able to sell mobile homes to be considered like a broker dealer. Um, but every state is different and just, again, make sure you understand your local laws and, um, I can't say this is how it is for the whole United States because every single state and every single city is, is very different. So, cool. Yeah. Any other questions before we talk about mindset? I am not seeing anything. I think right, we're good. Mindset is everything. Okay. <laughs> and I say that because you could know all of this stuff about mobile home parks, about multifamily, you could have the most knowledge about real estate investing enough to be the most successful real estate investor ever. But if you don't have the mindset to go with it, it's not going to mean anything at all. And you, if you don't have a success mind, you won't be able to grow to be that person to achieve those goals you have. So, and that, that's when, when you hear people talk about mindset, a lot of times what I think about is, is just mindfulness and understanding what successful people, how they think and how, what sets them apart. And it's, it's their mindset. It's not how much money they make. It's what they, the amount of value that they can give to other people based on their mindset. And they know they're forever students and they continue growing as a person so they can deliver more value to more people. And that is what they receive in abundance. So, you know, the biggest thing, a positive mental attitude is, literally just contagious and a negative attitude is like infectious, right? It's almost even worse. It spreads even worse. So if you have a positive mindset, like if you consider what you're saying to yourself and your self talk, that's going to translate into the attitude that you pretty much convey to other people into the world. And that is what you will receive back at you. So I mean, would you rather have, you know, success, like positive results or negative results? Because you're, it starts with your self-talk and, and that positivity is really about how you react to things. And when something happens to you, it's, it's not about what happens to you. It's 10% about what happens to you and 90% of how you react to what happens. Absolutely. Okay. And if you have a positive mental attitude, like regardless of what happens, 
no problem. I got it, man. Someone else has dealt with this. I'm, I'm going to be able to deal with it too. And a lot of that comes with your confidence and being able to kind of um, respond well um, to, to certain situations. But like I said, yourself, it starts with your self-talk. That'll translate into your mindset and your attitude and your attitude will turn into your actions and how you act and your behavior and what you convey out to the world. And that's going to generate your results. So be very close, pay very close attention to what you're talking to yourself in your head. Um, are you, you know, is your self talk helping you or hurting you bottom line? Like, are you inspiring yourself? Are you motivating yourself? Are you saying, I'm never going to be able to do this, man. I'm, I'm in so much pain. There's, there's, you know, there's not enough time. I don't have enough time. I, you know, I'm not smart enough. You need to cut that out right now today. Um, because you have to give yourself that positive reinforcement up here before you can go make it happen. Yeah. Now there's still times where it creeps in. Cause like, of course, like I mean, we're, only, weeks, we're only human. Yeah. A couple I mean, of weeks self- before the summit, like I was crying and I was like, I'm done. I can't do this. I can't make it work. And I was on a, I was getting on a podcast with my friend Peely and she's like, it's already a success. It's this, it's a success because you're doing it. She's like, you're doing great. And here, <laughs> but I was just the, like, Oh, here's the, the couple takeaways from that. And, and first of all, we're only human. It, it, it's going to happen, especially from our fear driven society. Um, you know, people telling us our whole lives that we can't do something. Right. And so first of all, it's it's who you surround yourself with. Like you said, you had a friend or a partner or something kind of give you that positive reinforcement and lift you up instead of pull you down. Um, Do you think if you had someone standing next to you said, yeah, you're probably right. This is pretty crazy. You're not gonna be able to do this. How do you think you would have responded at that point? You know, Um, you're right. I need to quit. (laughs) Exactly. So good thing. You're making good decisions. You're hanging out with the right people. Okay. And so that negative self-talk and that self-doubt is literally just like a brick wall. It's going to stop you. And a lot of it is these, these small words and understanding instead of saying, I can't do this, just say, how can I, how can I figure this out? You're just, you're going to, you know, engage different wiring in your brain, your, your positive and your creative thinking, critical thinking brain and you're smart enough to figure it out. I guarantee freaking you are. You're just not stopping yourself. You're not putting that brick wall of I can't do this. So then I'm, now I'm just going to give up and go do something else like watch Netflix. How can I do this? You're going to think for a minute. You're going to slow down. You'll be like, oh, I could just call this person because they said that they're an expert at it. And they told me to reach out to them whenever I want. Right. And so you need to remove can't from your vocabulary. Oh, yeah. You need to remove hope from your vocabulary because hope is not a strategy. Well, I hope I'm going to be able to do this, you know, by the end of the year, I hope I can close on my first property. No, it's up to you figure out how to make it happen. Okay. You have full control. You either make it happen or you don't hope is not a strategy. That's what people who invest all their money in the stock market are doing. They're hoping that it goes up so they can have enough money one day to live off of and treat and, and treat their families well and, and, and live in retirement. Right. And so remove can't from your vocabulary, remove hope from your vocabulary and there's one more and remove try from your vocabulary. You're not going to try to do anything. You're not going to try to get into multifamily. You are a multifamily real estate investor and you will successfully become a multifamily real estate investor. And you tell yourself that every day, those affirmations are going to help you figure out how to do it. Because a try is another word for, well, the first obstacle, I'm going to fail and just give up. No, I'm not going to try anything ever. I'm not going to hope for anything ever. And I'm not ever going to tell myself can't because I'm going to say, how can I? And that all goes back to your why. I mean, this, this really goes back to your why. Why are you doing this? Is it deep enough? Is your why emotional enough? Is it meaningful enough to get you through those brick walls and those I can't and all those people who say you can't and all that fear that our society brings on us? Is your why deep enough. So I think there's another slide that might talk about the why. So it's so important. I mean, going seven layers deep is an exercise that I think we should all do um, all the time. But next is, how, you know, how do you brain feed? What are you exposing your mind to? Are you watching the news, the CNN, the constant negative news, all that bull crap that's on the news? You understand that their goal is to get ratings and make money. So they, they're just trying to give us information to get ratings and to raise drama. They're not trying to give you information because they want to inform you, all right? They're giving you information to make money and for high ratings. So are you exposing yourself to 
negative, you know, media, or are you exposing yourself to the inspiring books and podcasts and things just like Angel is doing for you guys? She's creating these amazing, you know, the, these amazing, the amazing educational, uh, you know, this content. This, you're in the right spot if you're doing this. How else are you brain feeding? Are you surrounding yourself with the right people? Are you know who are you influencing on so who are you following on social media? What influencers are you really paying attention to? Right? Are you looking at the? Are you hanging out with the people who gossip um, and talk about other people? Or are you talking? Are you hanging out with the capitalists and those entrepreneurs that have a success mind? Because small minds talk about other people, but large minds like your minds talk about how to add more value to this world and how to create ideas to help other people. Right. So and I would, I would just add there, like, so I went from, I'm not going to say all teachers are negative. They're not. Um, but I went from my W2 where I was a teacher and I went to a few of my teacher friends. I'm like, Hey, we should do a summit. Like what I'm doing for real estate for education. And they were like, Oh no, that'll never work. We can't do that. And finally, there were four of us that were going to do it together. And one of them, we were in, our daughters were at a science meet. And so she and I went to the coffee house for like three hours. And she watched me like taking calls, doing messages and all this stuff for the summit that was upcoming. And at the end of when we were fixing to go pick our girls up, she was like, you know, this is, I think we can do this. Um, but it was a long process. Whereas when I'm surrounded by people in the real estate investing space, it's like, I can come at people with the craziest idea and they're like, Oh my God, yes, do it. Yep. And it's just, it's a whole different group of people and a whole different mindset and it's a whole different support system. Totally. So man. it's absolutely important. Absolutely. And, and like you, you but when you said that I, I couldn't, uh, you know, help thinking about the fact that as I be, have become a better investor, I've just been, be, I've just become a better person because in order to be a successful investor, you have to grow as a human. You have to just learn how to add more value to people in different ways. And so as you become a better investor at the same time, you're just becoming a better person. You're going to be able, you're going to become a better leader, a better, you know, spouse. You're going to be able to communicate better, lead better. You know, you'll have more work ethic. You'll just be figure out ways to, manage your time and decrease stress and all this other cool stuff. Um, and that's another thing I love about real estate, man. It, you know, the sky's the limit. And if you want to reach that sky as an investor, I mean, you're just going to have to be that much better of a person and a, as a human, and you could just help that many more people. Right. So. Yeah, well, um, and, and honestly, we all want to help someone. Yeah. It, it's, it's just such a different community. It's not, Oh, look at what she's wearing. It's more like, walking up to that person and saying, Hey, um, you know, your tags hanging out or, you know, you're, this is going on with your skirt or something, you know, it's, it's that support versus let's talk about somebody. Um, and the other thing I've noticed too, is that first off, you're going to surround yourself with people that are, are where you want to be. And those people are going to help you get there. And so it's just, it's a completely different kind of community. And it's, you're absolutely right. It's like, I don't even know how to like really put it into words. It's just, it's, so yeah, yeah. it's 180 degrees different from any community I've been involved in before. Well, you've made the choices to put yourself in those environments. A lot of people want to achieve what you've achieved, but aren't willing to go to the conferences and network with people and put together this amazing academy and, and help other people and add value to other people's lives. Um, you made intentional decisions to put yourself in those situations. And that's why you've grown, you know, um, to who you are and that you won't stop. And I mean, people like, people like us, dude, I mean, you know, people, you know, that, that had that, uh, you know, scarcity or fear mindset will look at you and be like, Oh my God, you've achieved so much. But I think deep down, we know we haven't even scratched the surface yet. Like for well, what we're going to, going to accomplish and our, our ambitions and the amount of people that we're able to help. Right. Haven't even, haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, yeah. Well, it's like what you said with the scarcity versus abundance mindset. Um, the, the first group of people that I was with have a very set scarcity mindset. Whatever I consume takes away from what they can consume. Mm -hmm. Whereas the reality is, is there is a ton out there and we can all sit at the same table and we can yeah. all eat. Oh my God. So much. But it's, um, it, it's hard to get there. And, and there yeah. are some things that I'm still like in that scarcity mindset. But for the most part, I've really grown into that abundance mindset. And it's, yeah. it just takes time and it takes it surrounding yourself with people yeah. that have that mindset as well. It, it's, I, I want to, I have to disagree and say it's not hard. It just oh, requires a commitment. 
and a why. If you're, if you're, if you're committed and your why is strong enough, you're going to figure out how. I mean, it, that, that, that's bottom line. Most people who just say, well, it's, it's too hard. I'm never going to be able to do it. They don't have a strong enough why. They don't have a desire enough to have them break through those brick walls, like I mentioned before, and figure out how. They're going to make up excuses. It's either you will do it or you'll make up excuses, other known as lies, right? And just sit off and just be comfortable. And I think that's one of the most selfish things you could do. Because if you, if you know how many people you could help, you know that you can create a better life for your family and for legacies and legacies in the, in the, in the future behind you. And, but you're not willing to do that because you want to be too comfortable. That's selfish. It, it is. No, it's, right. it is. Eat, it's eat ratio. I love talking about this because <laughs> this is all about time. Time is the one thing we can't get back, right? So how do you spend your time? The most successful people have – Use this rule of thumb, the E to E, 80 to 20, education to entertainment ratio. You have all your free time, whether it's a, a weekday where you have your nine to five. And then so before that, after that, maybe if you have any breaks, you take all that time. 80% of it should be dedicated on growth, education, personal development, building your business, you know, and 20% of that should be dedicated to entertainment, your hobbies. What do you like doing for fun? Taking your spouse out on a date, whatever it is. So that is where the mind feeding feeding is. And here, here's like a hint is if we have the nine to five, right? During nine to five, the E to E ratio, right? The 80%, most of that should be geared towards building relationships and getting with and engaging with other people because that's your office hours. That's when the doors are open. That's when people are kind of hustling. That's when people are kind of open to talk to other people and, most likely when you hit a brick wall, you can't figure out how it's you're one conversation away from figuring out how to get around that or get through it. Okay. You're one conversation away. All right. And that's either talking to angel reaching out to me and I'll give you guys my number. I mean, I'll hop on a call with any, anybody who's watching this right now and, and give you a free strategy session to help you figure it out. Right. You're usually one conversation away. You're a lot of times you're one conversation, one podcast, one book, one, you know, you know, what article, you know, you're one person, one conversation, one offer away from getting to the next level. Right. So the nine to five is people engage with more people during nine to five during the week, right? Before the nine to five, after the nine to five, that is where 80 to 20 is important, but you got to take your 20% entertainment seriously. That's when you're not thinking about business. You're not thinking about it. You're thinking about what you're most passionate about, your family, your, you know, your hobbies. Uh, for me, live music, you know, I got a show tonight. That's my, in my 20% entertainment. I'm going to play drums. Love to do that. I love to go entertain people and, and play music, listen to music, um, so I love using this 80, 20 E to E ratio because it's just so freaking important. Um, do we have some questions coming in? It looks like it. Um, Keisha just wanted to say, you know, this guy is obviously experienced. Great presentation. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is actually straight from the multifamily Academy um, that we put together, um, you know, on, on, to teach military members on how to, how to invest successfully in multifamily real estate. And there's a whole entire module just on mindset. And we had like, we embed mindset into every single Academy cause it's so important. Um, but I appreciate that. That means a lot. I put a lot of work into it and this is just stuff I'm super passionate about. So morning routine. So it doesn't have to be in the morning. It just has to be a time that you do you right. That you take your 80% where you dedicate your growth, your meditation, you're talking to God, you're working out your, it's your quiet time your affirmations, your journaling. You have to have a routine where it's quiet, no distractions. That's why I love doing it in the morning between four and 5 a.m. I'm up because nobody's bothering me. It is my time to pound some black coffee, sit quiet. What am I grateful for today? What am I going to crush through today? What, how am I going to get uncomfortable? And how am I going to make my business and life better, faster, more efficient? Those are the three questions I ask myself. I write every day and I read every day, but I ask myself those three questions. How can I make my business and life better, 
faster, more efficient. And it's pretty freaking black and white and easy. Okay, cool. All I have to do is this. And then I go do it, right? Um, make, it, make sure you're taking time for you where it's super quiet and you're, you're able to, to, to really have you time, all right? It's super important. It's something that all of the most successful people on our planet do, okay? Successful people, the most successful people, manage their time better than most people because they value their time and others' time more than most people. Time is the only thing we can't get back. So I love being freaking frugal with my time, all right? Um, it's really, really important that you understand how your time is being sent, that you start tracking it if you haven't yet. The best thing I've done a couple of years ago is I started time blocking, simply just using my iPhone iCal app, just the calendar app in your smartphone. From the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, what am I doing every 15 minute increments, right? That is how you just track your time. You know you gotta make a phone call, assign it a day, assign it a time, assign it a 15 or 30 block of time, the next day or whenever it is, you know, you know, you got to crank out, you know, this lesson, or, you know, you got to follow up with this person, you know, you have a meeting to go to, you know, how you have a phone call with the team, time block it, assign it a time. Okay. And not only does it like clear your brain, so you don't have to remember all the things you're trying to do, but it will remind you, right? You could set a reminder, 15 minute, 30 minute reminder, whatnot, whatever you want. So it's a to-do list. It'll remind you and it allows you to hyper focus and kind of gives you that check block dopamine hit, you know, that you've, that you actually accomplished something. Once you see it, it's grayed out in your calendar. Um, all the reasons why I love time blocking. It's so easy just to do it. It takes literally five seconds to block a timeout. And a lot of that time is for you. Like I have my time blocked out when I work out, when my, when my wife and I have like our bath time or our date time when I read, when I study, when all my phone calls, it's just, it's your calendar. And I'm not saying you have to be that good right now. Just, it's all about baby steps, growing 1% every day and just get into a habit because habits are really what is the game changer between people who struggle and people who are able to achieve, achieve success is they, they have done these things and they have formed habits where they don't have to think about it anymore. It's just habitual. So, from the time you think of all your great ideas, I know whoever's watching right now probably has amazing ideas that, that, they, that they want to implement. So from the time you have those ideas to the time you actually implement it will dictate your success. No more than 24 hours should go by in between the time where you have your idea and you implement it. If it's more than 24 hours, it's slowly going to be forgotten about. It's slowly going to be less and less uh, important for you because of all the other whirlwind of all this other distractions that we have going on in the world today, right? Especially on social media and technology when a lot of us don't have to actually physically go to work, right? So speed of implementation is so important. Do not wait. If you have a great idea, time block it, right? If you have a great idea, put it in your calendar within the next 24 hours to execute and implement. And I'm telling you, you could just slowly say, well, if I know I need to you know, call a broker to ask them about this market, to build a relationship with them within 24 hours, schedule that time, put their phone number and their name in the note. So when the time block reminder pops up, all you got to do is click it and it automatically call. So you don't have to really go out of your way to figure out who it is, what the number is. Just put the information in the note and then bam, it'll just pop up and you give them a call and say, Hey, introduce yourself. Let me, I don't care about me right now. I want to learn about you. Tell me about you. Tell me about your goals. Tell me about what, you, why you got into real estate. Do you invest? What do you like to do for fun? Any questions about that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm just going to back you up on it because after my summit, I really lost traction because I, I didn't have any, what am I going to do after? So it was like after the third day and it was all over, it was like a letdown that I wasn't still going. And it was more like, well, what do I do now? And I didn't write anything down. And it took me a solid four weeks to start regaining my traction. So absolutely, it's important to take care of it, start doing something 24 hours after you've got the idea or after you're finished with one thing or you're, you're just going to lose traction. Speed of implementation is key. I mean, even if you write that, you know, uh, on your 
on your phone uh, screensaver. So every time you look at your phone a thousand times a day, as much as we all, all do, you'll remember speed of implementation, you know, or you, or, or you can maybe put um, a tangible reminder of your why. Why are you doing, why are you guys even here right now? So I really want to know, you know, why some of you guys are listening to this when, when we're done, which is actually, I think the last slide is actually the why. And I have a call here in about 10 minutes. So I got to really wrap this up, <laughs> but I think we're almost done. Um, so guys, health is wealth. I'm not going to beat this down. I mean, I just came from the gym, you know, not a week goes by where I'm really, really, really breaking out of my comfort zone in the gym five or six days a week because you break through barriers in the gym, you will crush through them outside of the gym. That's just how it works, man. There's so many benefits. I've listed a bunch of them here. You're going to improve your energy, your cognitive function. You'll have better memory. You'll have better confidence. You'll be more happy. You'll have better relationships. You'll sleep better. You'll have more strength. You know, you'll decrease your stress. You'll decrease body fat, decrease your injuries, decrease chance of high blood pressure, cardiovascular, like all this stuff. But most people come up with some kind of excuse why not to exercise regularly. And I want to scratch my eyes out because it's an excuse. That's all. It's a lie. Okay. Take the time because if you really want to be successful in business and in real estate and investing, you will make time to improve your health and nutrition. Okay. I'm telling you, these are just habits, dude. Just do it. Just figure out. Even if tomorrow, if you haven't worked out in years, I don't care. Tomorrow morning, wake up, get out of bed, do one push up, one sit up, and one <laughs> jumping jack. The next day, guess how many you're going to do? Two sit ups, two push ups, two jumping jacks, right? The next day, dude, I'm telling you, 1% better. Go walk like for 10 minutes. If you haven't, like, I really hope that this doesn't apply to anybody that I'm talking about, but move your body every single day. I mean, my wife, she is super into fitness. She's a fitness trainer and a, and a spin instructor. And she loves like the Apple watch um, because you could like get into different challenges with other people like that. Make sure they close their circles on their watch. Like this is how many steps I've done. I've moved once an hour. I've burned this many calories. And then it's like she's competing with other people. Then they all hold themselves accountable. It's not really a competition. It's an accountability group. So do it, partner with somebody, be like, Hey man, I want to get more healthy and I want you to get more healthy so we can crush through it. Like if, especially if you if, if it's your business partner, um, I'm not going to beat this down anymore. It's just, you know, whether you're trying to improve your health, your finances, improve your relationships, uh, your cash flow every month, what you pay attention to will improve. What you track will expand, right? Where your focus goes energy flows if you don't pay attention to it it's not going to improve i mean i'm telling you man like if you know you want to lose weight and get stronger or whatever track your caloric intake use the free my fitness pal app and just scan the barcodes of what you're eating just so you know how much you're how much you're eating i guarantee you you will drop 20 percent calories within the next month just because you'll, you'll be lazy like look i don't want to scan something so i'm not going to eat it i don't need it you know um, and then set yourself up with a goal. Like, okay, I'm only going to eat 2000 calories today. Then you'll know, like over the last, like do it for like two weeks, you'll know how many calories you're, you're eating. And then you'll, you'll be able to say, okay, I'm going to eat maybe 10% less than that. Then, you know, you've less calories, you're going to lose weight straight up. And then if you start moving your body more, dude, compound effect. Relationships guys. I mean, I, I could talk about how important this is. I kind of already have. Um, if you think you're going to do this alone, you need to stop. All right. Coaches, mentors, your partners, partner with everybody that you come into contact with in this business. Try to learn more about them. Try to build a long-term relationship and people will see that. People will recognize that and you'll, influ and you'll influence them. Um, listen to when they're talking to you. Be genuinely interested in them. Praise them in public. All the basic stuff that we all should know. Um, and if you haven't read How to Win Friends, and Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, dude, playbook for success. How to Win Friends and Influence People. Hands down, probably a book that has had more impact on me. Probably pretty close to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm telling you. Wow. Um, 
how to win friends and influence people was it was a profound impact on my life um i hope it's it has for you guys and if if it hasn't yet i hope you take one thing away from this whole presentation and read that freaking book man coaches and mentors i mean the minute i hired a coach and i like had paid mentors that immediately got me to the next level uh this is kind of like the core five guys that started adpi um these are my boys i mean we are business partners. We invest in apartments and mobile home parks together, and we've built this community now with the help of a lot of amazing people. Um, Victoria was added. Uh, the girl that actually connected, Angel and I, Jill, were then, so there's our actually seven founders of ADPI. Um, but we all have coaches. We all have mentors. I have um, a couple different types of coaches. As long as I want to continue growing and continue adding more and more value to others, I will have paid coaches straight up. Uh, you guys, you already know you are the average of the five or 10 people you spend the most time with, like straight up. If you right now on the left, take a blank piece of paper on the left side of that paper, write down the, the 10 people that you spend the most time with, then figure out whether you guess or not how much they weigh, how much money they make, how they dress, what their attitude is more or less, you know, how they treat their spouse, um, what, whatever, all these different things. You are an average of all of that. There's nothing you could do about it. We, it's inevitable. So if that's the case, be very, very, very picky on who you spend your time with. All right. Not only because time is so freaking valuable, but because those people are going to influence you are. And, and you got to ask yourself, are they engines that are taking you to the next level? Or are they anchors that are holding you down? All right. The minute you stop growing, you start dying. You are a forever student. The most successful people on our planet get to that point because they grow and they learn something new every day, straight up. They're readers. They, they learn. They network with other people who are better than them, who are more successful than them, and they continue growing. All right. There's always more people to help. You just have to grow to become that person to help more people. All right to add more value. Um, you receive more abundance when you could deliver more value and you deliver more value by growing and learning more and more every day, every day, you 1%, that's it. 1% every single day. Then it's going to become a habit. Then you're like, man, I can learn more than 1%. Then you can learn 1% in multiple facets of life. You can grow your health. You can grow your business. You can grow your marriage or your most important relationships. You can become a better philanthropist and give more. You know, 1% in one facet of life is all I'm asking you guys. And it's your only challenge that I'm giving you. Okay. Could grow more and more every day. So I have literally like seven minutes till I have to jump on another call. I want to know somebody volunteer. I want to hear why they are here. Why are, why did you show up right now today to this, uh, this, this uh, presentation? Does anybody have the ability to use their mic right now, or is it a webinar? Um, so just type it. People are really. Why are you quiet. here? All right. Well, since Carrie's not saying anything and Keisha is not saying anything, so let me. I'm gonna tell you what my why is. Um, just to kind of give people, mine is really big, and not everybody's gonna have one like this. But we've got a special needs son. He has a really rare genetic condition, like 1,400 people in the world have it. Um, there's not a lot known. There's one group. It's called the, like the Duke 15Q Alliance, and they are the only group that um, researches it, provide education about it. Um, and every year, if we raise $100,000, it's a big deal. Um, and what our ultimate goal is, is to be able to create an endowment that gives personally, us, $100,000 a year to that alliance. Man, that's awesome. Um, just because that's what we want to do. And the other thing we want to do is we want to create a legacy of wealth that is enough so that our daughters never have to worry about anything other than loving their brother. You know, it'll take care of his medical, his housing, his, you know, his medical professional needs. Everything he's ever going to need in life once we're gone is going to be provided for so that seriously, all our daughters ever have to do is love their brother. So our why is really big. Um, not everybody's why is going to be that big, but it is going to be that important to them. Well, why is them only ever having to worry about loving 
loving him, why is that important? Um, so I have a unique experience with discrimination. Um, oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, we've actually been in Sam's before and I've watched parents like pull their kids away from our, our flat pattern. Like they think their kid's going to catch what my son has. Like it's contagious or something. Um, and so loving him the way he is, is just very important to me. And he isn't accepted by a lot of people in society because he's different. So, so usually it, it takes a little bit longer, um, to get that deep. And the fact that she was able to convey and be vulnerable enough to show her emotion shows you just how strong angel is as a person. Do you think most people would be able to open up and, and talk about something that is meaningful that makes them cry um, when we're live where who knows how many people are going to end up watching this? Um, so th th this is this is the perfect example, especially because I got to wrap this up. But you have to ask yourself, well, wh well why am I here? Well, because I want to learn. Well, why? Why do you want? Well, I want to I want to learn how to invest in real estate because I want to get good at it. Well, why? Well, because I want to be able to be financially free one day. Well, why is that important? Well, because I want to be able to take care of my mom or because I want to do this or I want to do that. Well, why is that important? Because I, because, and then dude, it usually takes seven or eight layers to go as deep as Angel did. She kind of probably knew where we were going with this. So she kind of like just cut to the chase. You, ha it has to be meaning. It has to be deep. It has to be meaningful. And then take that tangible reminder and have it somewhere visible every single freaking day on your cell phone, on your, in your car dashboard where you get dressed every morning, have it up a vision board. So it's a tangible reminder. Why am I getting up this morning? Why did I show up to this presentation instead of watching Netflix and chilling? Right. Why am I staying up late when my whole family's asleep? Why am I reading about global economies? Why am I learning how to conduct due diligence? Because you already know the why, because you went through that exercise. I challenge you guys all to go through the exercise. I challenge you guys to come up with your real why and share it with your social media followers. Okay. I don't think you realize you, and if you couldn't put it in a story where it's like kind of like a creation and, and a fall and like a, a revelation. And if you can capture your why and put it into your story, I don't think you understand how many people are going to have no idea what you're doing, what you're doing. People are going to come out of the world work and like show so much more respect for you. They're going to want to do business with you. They're going to want to just hang out with you. They're going to want to learn more about you. I challenge you guys um, to come up with your why, continue building relations with other people and share your why on Facebook and turn it into a story and share your why on all the social media platforms that you're on and your life will change. I will, freaking assure you it will so um i gotta wrap this up I, I appreciate all you guys um i'm very active on on linkedin the timothy kelly i'm very active on instagram the timothy kelly i'm very active on on facebook mostly in our group at active duty passive income it's a group of about twelve thousand members mostly military pastor president and their families um if you guys want to hop on a call pick my brain i want to help you um just because I love what Angel's doing and I want to be able to provide you. You guys just give me, just shoot me a text and we'll hop on a phone. We'll hop on a phone call. So you can text me at 847-910-9161. 847-910-9161. Um, I'm, I'm just going to type it in the, uh, the chat box. Uh, I was trying to type it in, but I think I got it wrong. <laughs> there you go. Um, awesome. Shoot me text, be like, hey, man, I heard you on the Academy. Um, thank you for what you do, right? Tell me that. And then say, hey, man, I want to take you up on your phone call, and, and I'll be happy to uh, hop on a call with you guys to get to the next level. Most, in most cases, in order to get to the next level, it's all about mindset and all about breaking through your self-doubt, right? Because um, you're going to be the only one that will stop you from achieving what you want and what you need to achieve for your family and your legacy. Okay, so stop being selfish. All right, guys. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I got a row. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.